Good afternoon. So my name is Dries van Trut, and in this talk I want to talk about the prospects for integration of graphene and 2D materials with silicon and siliconite when it comes. Before starting into the details, I first want to discuss a little bit the reason why we want to do it uh, and why this could be potentially interesting. Because yeah, silicon photonics, as you probably know, uh, is, is now widely available from, from uh, a wide range of providers uh, from, from research institutes like IMIC and LITI to uh, big uh, industrial players like Global Foundries and uh, TSMC. And it's both accessible for high volume commercial use but also for small volume research and, and small companies. Silicon Photonics Platform has, has all the basic components, at least at first sight, that you would need for building complex photonic ICs, uh, and that includes um, modulators, of course, yeah, typically PN depletion uh, junction based modulators. Uh, you also have ring, uh, ring modulators uh, also using this PN depletion. You have very efficient, very good uh, germanium detectors. Some platforms, in particular the platform from IMIC, has uh, very fast germanium electrode absorption modulators. There's also the uh, couplers for coupling lights in and out of the circuits and so on. Nevertheless, um, some building blocks are missing uh, or, or not fully satisfactory, however. For example, this uh, electrode absorption modulators, they are really uh, great devices for direct intensity modulation but they have limited optical bandwidth. They typically operate only over a bandwidth of, of 20, 30 nanometers. They're temperature dependent and only a limited number of fabs are offering them. Um, silicon depletion modulators, uh, the workhorse horse currently for uh, phase modulation, but they suffer from residual amplitude modulation. And so in application where you want pure phase modulation, they are not really uh, very applicable. Um, and they have a difficult trade-off between efficiency, loss, and speed. So if you want a fast device, typically it will be quite lossy, or it will be not so uh, efficient. Germanium detectors are great uh, for telecom applications, but in other wavelength ranges, for example, the visible or longer wavelength ranges, uh, they're not really uh, useful. Uh, silicon has very limited, well, has uh, non-linear effects, um, but they also suffer if you want to exploit the, um, let's say, the real part uh, of the nonlinear effect, they also suffer from two photon absorption, which makes it difficult to really make uh, efficient uh, nonlinear uh, devices. And there is, most of all, there is no efficient sources, no efficient light emitters uh, natively in the silicon photonics platform. Furthermore, the standard active building block that I discussed above, um, so all of these require quite complex processing. Certainly, if you start combining them, uh, you need many uh, steps of implantations, uh, germanium growth, and so on, uh, a lot of metals. And, and, and their availability is mostly limited to the telecom range. So the question is, can we do better using graphene and 2D materials? And, and better that not only means, it can mean better performance, pure performance wise, speed, bandwidth, temperature. It can also mean cheaper, for example, or um, uh, can we address new wavelength ranges? And so it can also be expand the functionality. We'll first have a look at intensity modulators because these have been investigated most intensively, I, I would say, and then the longest also. Uh, next to maybe uh, detectors. And there, the competition of basically the state of the art, as, as I already touched upon, are the germanium electro absorption modulators. And I'll go spend a little bit more time here because that also allows to, um, to, to discuss a little bit the, um, um, the, the figures of merit, the relevant figures of merit that we have to address also when, when looking at um, uh, graphene modulators. So these are the on, on the left here, so these three colored curves give you the insertion loss of a germanium, silicon germanium electroabsorption modulator as function of wavelength for different drive voltages. Yeah? So for one uh, volt, for two volts, and for three volts. So if you look for the moment at the three volt drive curve, uh, that's this one, then, um, sorry, I'm, uh, uh, I'm wrong, of course. So this is not the insertion, so this is the extinction ratio. And so here uh, to the right, we have the three volt at 1550, you have an extinction ratio about five dB for a certain length of, uh, I think this is for a uh, 30 micrometer. Uh, and to the right here, we have the insertion loss. And you see the insertion loss decreases with um, increasing uh, wavelength uh, down to three uh, dB. 
And so what we see, so in this wavelength range here, the two volts applied uh, voltage, we see that the extinction ratio is more or less equal to the insertion loss. So our figure of merit uh, so, uh, is around one, which is not really great. Eh? If you go to um, the commercial immunophosphate based, 3.5 uh, semiconductor based uh, electroabsorption modulators, it's considerably better. But so these devices are directly integrated in the, in the silicon platform, which is a big advantage in terms of availability. And they have a very, they have an amazing bandwidth. Eh? So in this measurement, you see, we, we uh, don't even can determine. Uh, so the, the bandwidth, it's, it's more than 50 gigahertz and uh, it's more than uh, 67 gigahertz. We basically, at this moment, we don't know exactly what the bandwidth is, but it's really nice in terms of bandwidth. And we have used them, or my colleagues have used them in, in more complex configurations, for example, here in, a, um, in dual parallel configuration to generate more complex uh, signal formats, uh, in this case, a pump 4 format, uh, to send data at 128 gigabit per second. We also expect further improvement using uh, quantum confined SART effect modulators, and uh, more information can be found here in this paper. So we expect further improvement in this figure of method. So we, we really we have to do better than this uh, if you want to expect that. Uh, and that's, that's not a question. Can graphene do better than this? So the basic device that we started out with was a so-called single layer graphene modulator. So originally prepared, proposed um, by Berkeley, already um, early in 2013 or something like that. So it's a doped silicon waveguide with then on top a graphene, uh, a sheet of graphene. If we apply now a voltage between the graphene and the silicon waveguide, then we can shift the Fermi level in graphene, uh, depending on, from its neutrality position up and down. And that um, will basically make the material transparent. And we go from a very absorbing state, uh, like this shown over here, at zero volt, we have a very absorbing state. If we apply a voltage, um, we go uh, to a transparent state. Ideally, we go to a fully transparent state. And so the red curve here is for ideal graphene. Um, and so at high voltages, we have almost a full transparent device. In reality, graphene, what the, the graphene that we get, and certainly the CVD ground, so the large scale graphene, is not as good, and the, there will be actually an insertion loss. These curves are symmetric, so applying a negative voltage or a positive voltage in principle gives you the, sa the, the same result. In practice, often the graphene is naturally doped by the processing, and then all these curves will be shifted. Uh, for example, in most cases, it will be p-doped, so these curves will be shifted towards the zero. You will have around zero uh, a, a large roll-off on the transmission. If you again look at a two-volt uh, voltage swing, then we see that yeah, we can, certainly for ideal graphene, we can get much better figure of merit than what I just showed for the germanium uh, modulators. Then if you start looking at realistic graphene, it's on the boundary already. And so you get still a little bit better figure of merit, theoretically, but it's not much better. So that already shows that it's really important to get uh, high quality graphene. So by the way, these curves are shown for 10 nanometer gate oxide. You can decrease the gate oxide and then this voltage that you have to apply will also decrease, but that will increase the capacitance and then the speed of the device will go down. Vice versa, if you increase the thickness of the gate oxide, uh, the device will um, increase in speed eh, because it's RC limited, eh, but then also the voltage that you have to apply will increase a lot. So there, there is already an intrinsic trade-off, um, which will be uh, very important, uh, as you will see also in future results. These are our initial results from 2014. Uh, and then at that time, it would show yeah, eye diagrams up to 10 gigabits, uh, the devices with a bandwidth showing up to 6 gigahertz. I think. The figure of merit at that time uh, was about 1 uh, at 2 volts peak to peak. And so we could get higher extinction ratios. And then we also had to apply uh, higher uh, voltages. Nice, however, is that the, the devices were over a wide wavelength range. And so here limited by the grading couplers that we use on the silicon platform. Uh, but in principle, you can go even to the O band as I will show later. And also it's fairly temperature independent. You could only go on this setup to uh, 50 degrees C, but basically nothing changes, uh, almost nothing changes if you increase the temperature. While in Germany, uh, the temperature, yeah, then uh, you have quite a shift of the um, 
the peak wavelength emission. More recently, uh, we, we investigated in detail what kind of doping is now best uh, for these modulators. And by optimizing that doping, uh, and by moving from N-doped silicon to P-doped silicon, we could increase the bandwidth considerably and could show up to 50 gigabit items. I have to admit they're uh, only partially open, but at 25 gigabit per second, they still look quite good. And here you see how the signal to noise ratio and the extinction ratio decrease with increasing bit rate. Note, so all these devices that I'll show typically will be the TM, will, will exploit TM-based polarization because these interact better with the graphene than the TE-based polarization. Uh, and this uh, here, we show a bit of the results of the paper that we published on omnibus optimization of the P and N doped uh, uh, silicon wave guides. So the, the point is that the graphene is typically intrinsically uh, P doped, and then the combination with P doped silicon gives you, uh, in general, in the, uh, in the region where you want to operate, a lower capacitance and a lower resistance, which allows you to go to uh, higher. Um, we also showed operation over as well O band and C band for these devices. And O band, you have to apply a little bit higher voltages uh, intrinsically uh, because then you have to open up a large band gap basically. Um, but overall, the performance is fairly similar with bandwidths up to uh, 18, 20 gigahertz, depending on the, the length of the device. And so uh, we also showed more complex devices, uh, as, as you can see here. So we integrated like um, five of these identical electroabsorption modulators. Uh, so with a uh, ring resonator based demultiplexer. So five channels were combined then on a single channel. So together this gives a five times 25 gigabit uh, data swing uh, in the, in the waveguide. Uh, earlier already also we demonstrated uh, like these uh, photonic crystal based switches. So we integrated a, graphene, a sheet of graphene on top of a photonic crystal. Um, if there is no voltage applied, then the graphene is in its absorbing state. And then by applying a voltage, we can make the graphene transparent and then increase the uh, uh, transmission of the, of the device. Basically here in this device, we reach an extinction ratio of 19 dB. Um, and, and much lower uh, for much lower insertion losses than in other devices. So that's a way uh, maybe to move forward and, and make more efficient devices. Although here, of course, we give up the most important advantage of graphene uh, being the fact that it's broadband, uh, because then intrinsically, because of the device structure, um, the, the photonic crystal, we make it a resonant device. And that's the same story. Also, people have demonstrated on uh, integration of graphene modulators on the ring. Uh, modulated on, on ring resonators. Of course, also there you reach a higher efficiency, but you give up the, the extra bandwidth. More recently, many people, most people actually are moving towards double layer devices where you no longer use a doped silicon waveguide, but um, a double layer of graphene on top of a passive waveguide, then, and you apply the voltage between the two graphene layers. Also, first proposed by, uh, by, by Berkeley. Um, also, people already quite some time ago, from, so the Lipson group showed integration on silicon nitride. And that's a big advantage, of course. You can just start from simple, very uh, low cost deposited waveguides um, to, uh, to, to, to make your modeling. And you no longer need this uh, difficult dope implementa implantation steps and, and silicon contacting steps uh, that you need for the, for the uh, original devices. Also, the effect is doubled, so you can make a shorter device, and in principle, you can make a faster device. In practice, however, it's uh, it's all not so trivial. Even in the design already, there is a lot of trade-offs to be considered. Uh, and so here we give a simulation of the um, transmission curves uh, for different gate oxide thicknesses. So here's six nanometer, and then we go 50 nanometer, 30 nanometer. And the gray zone is like for one, uh, the zone that the, um, extinction you can get for a one volt um, peak to peak uh, swing. And so if you go for a tin uh, oxide and then you can really get a very high um, extinction, 
even for uh, for for bad graphene. Yeah? So this black the, the black curve is for, uh, for for really bad graphene, at least in simulation. So then you get a decent figure of merit. Uh, and as soon as you go to somewhat reasonable uh, graphene, you get you get a nice uh, figure of merit in terms of extinction ratio versus insertion versus. The problem is that for such a thin thin uh, gate oxide, the capacitance will be very large and the bandwidth will be limited. It's difficult to say what the exact bandwidth will, uh, will be because it's very dependent on, on the assumptions you take for the resistance, but we estimate like six to 10 gigahertz for such a device. And if you make the, 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 the gate oxide much thinner, then you can go to much higher bandwidths. And in the meantime, that, that has, that, that's what, so all the, the, the high bandwidth devices that have been demonstrated in literature are based on this, uh, on this approach. And we're always using a very thick gate oxide. Then you can reach this 30, 40 gigahertz bandwidth. The problem is that then for one volt swing, which is what you would really want eh, if you want to combine with low, uh, low power consumption CMOS riders, and then your um, extinction ratio uh, decreases a lot. So that's the, the trade-off you have to make and that you have to live with. That's in, uh, the theoretical uh, considerations. In practice also, uh, it turns out that fabrication of these devices is far from trivial and people uh, suffered a lot to do more than, uh, um, let's say, a proof of principle device. Yeah? So there have been a lot of proof of principle devices in literature, but really doing this on a reproducible way and, and over a, a large number of devices is far from so here you see, for example, from our work, the so response curves of these five uh, uh, devices. Yeah, you, they look pretty good. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have a decent extinction ratio, not too high losses. But there's quite some variability between the devices. And what most people also uh, not tell you in, in papers, so this is a sweep taken only in one direction from negative to positive bias. But often we see if we do um, the double sweep and eh, going from negative to positive and then back from positive to negative. There is a huge, really huge hysteresis in many of these devices. So people had to fight a lot to overcome these uh, these drawbacks, uh, but now several groups have done exactly that. And for example, there's, here, there's a result from uh, CNIT in uh, Italy uh, in collaboration also with several other people um, in the graphene flagship project. Um, so they they really optimize the gate oxide. They use a combination of boron nitride and um, silicon nitride uh, to optimize the gate oxide, uh, and they manage to get uh, really high speed operation up to 50 gigabit per second. Um, nice extinction curves, uh, uh, with very good overlap with simulation, except for the insertion loss. Uh, so the insertion loss. 7 dB was still much higher than what you would expect uh, from pure simulations. Um, and and uh, it had to do with, with the, the difficult processing of these structures. In the meantime, uh, again, uh, yeah, you just know from the old company, they, they have improved this a lot and, and we can expect uh, much better results in the near future. So this was about intensity modulators. There is, of course, also the work on phase modulators. Um, to, to situate that, um, so if we apply a voltage, so these are the, is the refractive index, and so the real part of the refractive index and the imaginary part of the refractive index, um, as a function of the chemical potential, basically of the applied voltage and then uh, uh, how these change. So till now we, we mostly look at the, the red curve and so how the real part, uh, the imaginary part of the effective image changes and, and operating in this regime. But if you look over here, there's also a very big change of the, the real part. Um, so it would be very nice if you could exploit that. The problem is that you have to operate at quite a high bias. And so if you want to operate in a, in a regime where the imaginary part is, is low, and so over here then the, uh, you have to operate uh, at really high bias. Uh, so close to, to breakdown or uh, of the available parameters. Nevertheless, so again, the people from uh, CNIT, also with coverage from IMEC and, and others, managed to, to realize such devices and showed, yeah, you know, actually quite, quite decent um, uh, phase modulators shown over here. 
Um, and with, so the intrinsic performance of these devices is better than what is currently available on the in standard CPU. Um, an alternative way is, is the work recently proposed by uh, the Lipson group and also by, for example, the group of uh, Volker Sarger. It's using uh, 2D materials, other 2D materials. So, um, uh, yeah, like uh, in this case, TMDC, transition uh, metal dichacolgenides. So, they made a stack of um, a TMDC, they, they tried different types of materials. Uh, and then uh, hafnium oxide and ITO, right? so the, to allow to inject basically uh, carriers inside the, uh, the 2D material. And they could show that indeed, so the, the uh, transmission curves of the as, uh, asymmetric container nicely shift uh, the applying voltage. V pi L of these devices is 0 0.8 volt centimeter. And particularly interesting is that there is a high delta N over delta K ratio. So this is again related to this. Uh, this is the figure of merit for phase modulators. So you want to change, have a large change of the phase and a very small change of the uh, amplitude. So it seems to be considerably better than the silicon, uh, where the yeah, delta N and delta K is more or less uh, one. So that's, that's the promising part. The difficult part is that, of course, the uh, overlap of the light with these 2D materials is very large. So this is still very long devices. And this is good delta N of delta K. That's actually also true for some 3 5 materials and also have this property. But the question at this point is uh, if these TMDCs can compete with hybrid silicon in phosphide uh, MOS moderators, as being proposed, for example, by NTP. That's an open question. Detectors, also an interesting uh, point of research. And, and very early on, there were several very high level, uh, very high level papers. Um, with uh, detectors being shown up to 50 gigabit, even 100 gigabit, uh, from the group at uh, AMO in uh, Germany. Then there was very little follow up or take up of these, uh, this work, um, let's say, in, in the more mature um, uh, founders, uh, more uh, application oriented research. The problem is that these devices, they show a very high bandwidth and a decent responsivity, but the high uh, dark current and high leakage current. So therefore, recently, people started looking at another architecture, uh, and I show here results from the Miller Group, uh, with a lot of partners also in the Graphene flagship. So they're using a, a graphene sheet, uh, contacted at two sides. But then on top, you see there are two other graphene electrodes. Uh, which also can be separately contacted and gate the graphene uh, on top of the silicon layer. In this case, it's, uh, the structure is embedded in the silicon uh, ring resonator, but it can also uh, do it in just, you can just integrate it just in a regular way. Uh, it has also been demonstrated in plasma electric configurations. Um, and then here you see the, uh, the results. Uh, so here you see the responsivity of the device. So it's uh, the left picture. Responsivity of the device as function of the applied um, uh, gate uh, voltages. Uh, and it's actually quite high. It's 90 volts per watt. Um, so what you also is interesting here, you have naturally a voltage generation, not a current generation. So that means that you can avoid the TIA as you need in a regular detector. It does, however, makes it a little bit difficult to, to compare this with the existing uh, detectors. But now, so the, the authors of this group, of the Miller group, did quite a uh, nice effort to compare, to really compare the sensitivity of um, commercial detectors with these detectors. And their claim is that they're actually on par in terms of sensitivity uh, with existing commercial uh, devices. And the bandwidth here is limited basically by the ring resonator, not by the graphene device itself, uh, to 10 gigahertz. Also, more recently, uh, there is a result from, the, for example, the um, Sorge group using 2D materials to make detectors. So these 2D materials, they have the uh, advantage, but TMDCs have the, uh, the advantage to have uh, a direct band gap. But typically, they have that band gap at shorter wavelengths. So they, first side, they are not applicable to telecom applications. However, what was special in this paper is that they showed that it's very easy to, to apply strain to these materials and shift the band gap from 
uh, from I think from uh, Modern Telegram. Um, uh, it's pro, well, it's it's certainly far below 1300 nanometer. So by uh, shift uh, by shifting it by by straining it, they could shift it to close to 1300 nanometer, um, and they could show quite decent uh, responsivities for these devices at uh, basically first second. The big question now is how to do this reproducibly. How can you do this on wafer scale? Uh, that's one. But uh, it shows an interesting route to go forward uh, with these detectors. So what's next? Uh, there is still many uh, routes and many many exploratory research in this domain. I just showed two results from our own work. Um, so recently, uh, a poster from our group that's working mostly uh, so in collaboration uh, with the England group and and at uh, at MIT. So he integrated, uh, of, of, yeah, uh, the team integrated um, tungsten diselenite, uh, a flake in this case, with silicon nitride wave guides we fabricate. And it's well known, I mean, uh, yeah, we are not the first ones uh, to show single photon emission from these uh, flakes. And, but um, uh, uh, basically, we were the first group to show single photon emission of these flakes coupled to uh, to silicon nitride waveguides. Mm -hmm. So what you see, uh, this figure shows the, the, the principle. So there is a, a tungsten diselenite flake integrated on silicon nitride waveguide. Uh, because the silicon nitride waveguide is not planarized, so there is, uh, it consists of the waveguide and air gaps and then again silicon nitride here. So the flake will be naturally strained a bit uh, during this transfer. And it's known from earlier research on these flakes, uh, where they were, for example, put on, on nanopillars, that at positions of, of high strain, there can be, um, you can have uh, basically formation of, of single photon uh, emitters. Uh, and that's basically what we see also in the, in the results. So here you see a top-down confocal image um, um, of the, yeah, yeah, the PL, uh, photoluminescence measured from that flake. And you see there's a few sharp spots um, along the waveguide, but then also outside of the waveguide. So this is a top-down confocal image. This is a, uh, so C, figure C, is a confocal image measured uh, through the waveguide. And then you see that there's only emission from the points uh, which are really, where the emitters are really on the waveguide. So the emitters which were outside of the waveguide, they are excited, but that light does not couple to the waveguide. So we, we don't measure it in a confocal scan. Uh, so more results here. So the top row is the same as I showed in the previous slide. So the bottom row, then figure B is a scan of the emission over the waveguide. Uh, and you see that indeed the waveguide is mostly concentrated. So that the emission is mostly concentrated on top of the waveguide. Then figure E here is the, uh, uh, the, the PL measured from the top for the emitters S1 and S2. So these emitters we don't measure in the waveguide because they are uh, located outside of the waveguide, as you see in, in figure A. And then F shows the emission from the emitters uh, S3 and S4, which are on top of the waveguide. And the solid curves are the ones um, measured from the top, and the dashed curves are measured from the waveguide. And you see that yeah, they show many overlapping peaks, but also not all peaks are overlapping. It has to do with the polarization of the emitters. And some emitters have a polarization which does not allow coupling to the waveguide. For example, if it's along the waveguide of the... So that's what we see here. Um, the figure on the right then also shows um, uh, the, the, uh, the G2 measurement, which clearly shows that yeah, the G2 goes below 0 0.5. So this confirms that this is really um, a single photon emission. Of course, it's far from perfect at this point, uh, and, and there's still a lot of room for improvement here. And then lastly, we also um, characterize the nonlinear properties of graphene uh, in depth um, uh, over the last few years, uh, because we noticed that so in literature there's a lot of information, there's a lot of papers on the nonlinear properties of graphene, but we, we, we noticed that the, the numbers which are being reported are basically all over the place. And they, they really vary very widely. And that's why we decided to do a more systematic approach to this. And so we, me we measured the nonlinear coefficient of graphene integrated with silicon nitride waveguide. And while it's being biased, and while 
um, using a polymer electron light so we could shift the Fermi level. And so we could measure the, the nonlinear properties um, as a function of the, uh, uh, of, the of the Fermi level. Because uh, uh, we, we believe that the widely varying uh, results in literature can be explained by the fact that people uh, they use different transfer methods. So also the natural the background doping of the graphene might be different. So the state of the graphene being measured might be very different. The approach that we used was a sort of a four wave mixing experiment, but then we use in addition a dispersive fiber to disentangle the uh, linear and the um, sorry to disentangle the nonlinear phase and amplitude uh, response, and that allowed to characterize then both the uh, the real part and the imaginary part of the no of the uh, nonlinear response. We will not go in detail here, but we indeed see that it's very dependent on the uh, applied uh, gate bias. It's also very dependent on the, the quality of the graphene. Um, and from these results to us, it, well, what you could see is that the nonlinear effects in graphene can be indeed substantial. But there is, again, there is a very strong trade-off um, for the, let's say, the, with, with the linear and nonlinear uh, absorption. Right? So we can have a large nonlinear uh, phase change. But then we also often will have a far, uh, uh, very large losses. And it's not clear at this point if we can find a, an operating point, which is then interesting for, for applications. So uh, I'm not saying um, it, it's not useful at all, I and mean, uh, there is no future at all for nonlinear uh, devices in graphene. We'll be very careful with the interpretation of, of literature results um, and, and, and what exactly we want to do. So that brings me to the conclusion. Um, there are many pro uh, promising avenues of, for application of graphene and TV materials in complex photonic ICs. I guess that's clear now. It is not clear now, however, what will be the field of application. Right? So at this point, uh, for most applications, still we are not really better than what is already available in uh, certain photonics platforms. We can maybe claim that they are, um, there are some exceptions with, with really. Uh, uh, for example, flake-based devices. And so there's, it, it's still not excluded that, that it's sort of, well, it's certainly not excluded that we will at some point do, do better, but there is more work needed on um, uh, reproducibility and scaling and so on. It's not hopeless, however. I mean, for example, um, uh, IMIC recently showed uh, transistors, uh, tungsten diselenite uh, transistors fabricated on 300 millimeter uh, devices and 300 millimeter. Pilot line, so that shows. Um, so, uh, so these are some results from from that work. It shows that this this technology is really scalable, yeah? um, but yeah, it, it still will cost a lot of effort to 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 get there and to to make these devices really uh, useful for practical applications. And I believe there's still a lot of room for innovative ideas. So the material is relatively easily accessible. So I would say, just go ahead and and come up with new ideas. That brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much.